So that's our picture diagram and we are at the beginning of the story and we are spending a lot of time on this story on this beginning and we are actually looking at the gap theory we find ourselves we're spending time in genesis chapter 1 verse 1 but we're trying to move to verse 2 and then we hit this theory this theory that is quite popular called the gap theory where we ended the last time is that we are not we, we are now looking at what are the evidence and people can say but there are evidences in the bible that actually shows that there is a gap between genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and genesis chapter 1 verse 2 what are these alleged scriptural evidences for the gap theory what are they and we're going to just look at some of those today but one of the things i'll tell you is that on closer examination of this test so-called scriptural evidences you will see that they 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 actually are not biblical they are not the right way to biblically to rightly interpret the bible okay they do not all those all those you know evidences that people will bring forward you will see that they they, they are not about a missing gap between genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and genesis chapter 1 verse 2 they are not so let's read genesis chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 so let's read it because this is where we are going to start examining this evidence from so let's read genesis chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of god moves upon the face of the waters and god said let there be light and there was light so that was genesis chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 so this is where we have to look at the evidence that people say okay yes i i i subscribe to the gap theory because there are evidences in the scripture yes people can say but yes i didn't believe in that because of the scientists or because of the geologies or because of the secularists but i'm studying the scripture and i can see in the scripture that this is what the scripture says the question is is it that hebrew experts agree that the grammar of genesis chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 does not allow for a gap because this is one of the greatest evidence that people try to bring out and many of those evidences are in those in those three verses so let's start with verses one and two remember what i just read this is not mine i i don't i was i don't know this thing by myself i search for it because one of the things i realized straight away is that something is wrong with this gap theory the bible says you have the holy spirit and the holy spirit teaches you okay something is wrong okay there cannot be sin there cannot be death there cannot be sickness before the fall. Okay, it just does not agree with the rest of the scripture. No matter what science wants to tell me. Okay, remember I said this. If there's a conflict between science and the Bible, I will take the Bible 100% of the time. Now, I may not understand, I may not be able to explain it, but I know somewhere down the line the Lord will help me to be able to. I may need to study more. Something was wrong. Okay, and, and then we now begin to study now the, the first the first thing that people talk about when we talk about evidences okay is the word that begins verse 2 in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and people want to tell us that that was the prehistoric that was the pre-adamic creation and then there was a gap and what people then say is that look at the word that starts verse 2 and the world was without form and void now you need to understand that the hebrew word war w a w render at the beginning of the verse two and by the way let me just warn you there are some technical things here so i'm going to be reading it out they are technical but they are important i'll read that again the hebrew word war rendered and at the beginning of verse two detail the state of the affair at that point not the next step in the flow of event in other words in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth by the way let me tell you the state of the earth before i go on in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth what was the state of the earth when god created the heavens and the earth this is very important and the earth not this is not what the earth became this is not the next step in the flow of event so when they said in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and that word and means wait a minute let me tell you the exact state of the earth when god created it that is the tense of that word in the original hebrew so verse 2 
describe the state of the original earth. Verse 2 is describing the state of the earth in verse 1. So that's the first thing. Number 2, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the heart was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. You look at that word, and the earth was worse without form and void. Now people will want to say, well, actually it should be translated, and the earth became again remember what i'm saying at this i'm using this as a test case as to how to handle the bible and how not to handle the bible the question is is that true the hebrew word there is haya and king james translation translated it words and the art words without form and void and king james and many other translations were right they didn't translate it become because the verb there i mean the word there it should not be translated become the Hebrew word Haya in verse 2, which King James translated and was, should not be translated became because this is not its primary meaning. There is a secondary meaning that it can mean become. But the primary meaning of that word is not become. And the context did not require a secondary meaning. Verse 2 is circumstantial to verse 1. Verse 2 is as a consequence of verse 1. Thus, words is the most natural and appropriate translation for ayah, and this is how it is translated in most English versions, even including the Septuagint. You remember the Septuagint? Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scripture. Most translation into English translate that word worse and not become because that is the way it should be translated. Remember, we've taken, we've looked at two evidences to call the beginning of that verse and tells us that actually there's no break between verse 1 and verse 2 and suggests that actually was telling you, let me describe the art for you that was created by God in verse 1. The number two is that contrary to what people want to tell you, the word and the and the art was without form and void. That was the right translation. It should not be translated became. Yes, it is true that that can be a secondary meaning of that word haya, but the primary foundational meaning of that word is not become. And the context is against that form of translation. And I tell you that this is the, it was rendered and the art was without form and void in many, many most English translations of the Bible. And it is also translated that way in the Septuagint translation of the Hebrew scripture because that is the way it should be translated. Okay, let's move on. Remember what I said, a lot of what I'm doing today can be technical, but this is important. When we understand that we are laying foundation, when we understand that the devil has used this issue of creation to overturn the fate of many, we see why it is important for us to stay and take a little bit of instruction. The next evidence that people have brought forth is that word without form void okay obviously we've talked about and we've talked about was not become and is the word without form and void and people will say well if god will create anything will he create it without form and void and my answer to that is it depends on what you mean by without form and void because people will now look at other scriptural verses and try to actually use that to say that look look at this part of the scripture and that part of the scripture could God have actually created the earth without form and word. But let me say this before I read my what I have here on my uh, on my document. Let me say that. Do you actually realize that a greater part of the universe is without form and void? That the reason why there is no life in some planets, if you go to just like if you go to some planet, some planet are too cold, some planet are too hot, some planet planet are too are too dark. Some there are a whole lot of this universe that you could potentially say are formless and void. Does that mean that God didn't create them, or does that mean that something happened to them and then it was destroyed? The word tohu and bohu, usually translated formless and void, are used in Genesis verse one. I mean Genesis chapter one verse two. And they imply that the original universe was created unformed and unfilled and was during the sixth day formed and filled by God's creative action. The word themselves did not tell us about the cause of the formlessness and the void. And every single place that this word are used in the scripture, the word by themselves does not tell you 
why it was formless or void. This word did not imply a process of judgmental destruction. Because what tends to happen is that people go to Isaiah chapter 34 verse 11 and Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 23 because those are the three places where those words are used together, formless and void. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, Isaiah chapter 34 verse 11, Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 23. But the problem oftentimes is that people want to use the context of Isaiah and the context of Jeremiah to explain the context of Genesis chapter 1. And that is bad exegesis. Remember one of the reasons I'm knocking this is because I want you to see how you study the scripture. Context. Study the scripture in its context. You cannot, when you studied without form and void in Isaiah chapter 34 and Jeremiah chapter 4, that was because there was a process of judgment in those two. You cannot read that back on Genesis chapter 1 if that was not the process in Genesis chapter 1. This word did not imply by itself, the word by itself, in itself, did not apply did, did not imply a process of judgmental it's just like if you have a knife a knife by itself does not mean somebody is going to be killed <laughs> okay it's when somebody takes the knife and kills somebody with it okay so the very presence of knife does not necessarily mean there's going to be a death the very presence of gun does not necessarily mean that somebody is going to die now it can mean that in a context but the presence of knife in another context can mean that we are going to use it to cut the meat that we are going to eat. The presence of gun in another context may mean that we are going to go farming or we are going to go hunting. Not necessarily that somebody is going to kill somebody. There is always a contest. So it's a bad exegesis to want to read the context of another part of the scripture into another part of the scripture. I know this is technical, but this is how you study the scripture or this, some of these ways not how you study the scripture. I will read that again. This word did not imply a process of judgmental destruction as seen in Isaiah 34 and Jeremiah 4. We must not bring the interpretation from this other part of the Old Testament with different contexts and import them into Genesis chapter 1. One theologian called Robert Chilholm Jr. wrote, It is unwarranted to assume that Jeremiah's use of the phrase in a context of judgment implies some sort of judgment in the context of Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Jeremiah is not interpreting the meaning of Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. And that is very important. So with that, and by the way, and by the way, the word formless, okay, I said the word without form and void together are used in those three places. But the term formless was used on its own in so many other places in the scripture. And it doesn't always imply the meaning of judgment. So, so the act was without form and void does not necessarily mean that there was a judgment that brought that formless and voidness. And by the way, the grammar of Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 does not allow for that. And I've already explained that. And the act was without form and void. The and worse does not allow for what we are trying to read into Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. And like I said, much of the universe actually can be described with this same formless and voidness. That does not imply a process of judgment on those areas of the world. Let's move on. Another word that people have used to try to read the gap theory into Genesis chapter 1 is the word replenish the earth. You know, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, God said, uh, multiply and replenish the earth and people say you see god said replenish and replenish means to refill so that means that it was filled before and god said refill uh, 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 uh. bad exegesis again bad exegesis and many people just receive it because dr fenor just said it or because my pastor said you know you need to go back and study the word replenish in king james version does not mean refill as though the earth was one was once before filled with people the pre-Adamic, the prehistoric, and they were destroyed, and God is telling Adam and Eve, go and refill. No. The word translated replenish simply means fill. It doesn't mean refill. And so why did King James translation translate it replenish? Again, I will explain. But in the original Hebrew, the word replenish does not mean refill. And this is why it is always good. <laughs> 
to ask yourself remember what we said the way we study the scripture what study and we have all those things now in our phone let me get my phone they are there i've introduced you to some of these things you already know them simple app that can help you to look at the original word of the scripture the hebrew word translated replenish simply means to fill to fulfill to be filled god didn't say go and refill god said go and fill go and fill the earth now why did king james translated it replenish the word replenish <laughs> oh, praise God. the word replenish meant to fill from 13th to 17th century that is what it meant now word changes meaning so when the king james version was translated the word replenish simply means fuel that was why the king james version that was published in 1611 that was why they used the word replenish obviously the word in our traditional use of the word in english has now come to mean to refill but when the king james version when they were translating the king james version replenish just simply means to fill and that is exactly what it means in the original translation in the original hebrew translation but what about the fall of satan because this is some of the things that people also read into this verse peter refers to the flood of noah's days because that's the other thing people people talk about you know the the Luci, lucifer lucifer's flood and they want to use what peter said in second peter chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 listen to me peter refers the flood that peter referred to in second peter chapter 3 verses 5 to 6 is the flood of noah's days not lucifer's flood it is the same as it did in first peter chapter 3 verse 20 second peter chapter 2 verses 4 to 5 in fact there is no reference to any luciferian flood anywhere in the scripture people are reading those things into the bible so the flood that peter referred to three times in first peter and second peter i think most of them are yes one in first peter two in second peter the flood that peter referred to was noah's flood the Bible does not refer anywhere in the scripture to any pre-Adamic flood, pre-historical flood called Lucifer, Luciferian flood. The Bible doesn't, doesn't say anything about that. Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28 describe the fall of real king. Now, this is very important, the way we interscript the scripture. Now, obviously, in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, we actually see the fall of satan but remember it's very very important that you need to understand that the prophetic when the prophets are speaking they are speaking to the people of their generation there is usually a primary story there's usually a primary event that they are speaking into now they do have prophetic implication they can have double meaning they can have prophetic meaning they can have messianic meaning but you need to understand that when prophets speak they are speaking to the people in front of them now yes they can have for example a virgin shall be with a child and we it has come to be a prophetic word for the lord jesus christ but you need to understand that there was a physical manifestation of that prophet prophecy during the time of isaiah and it's the same thing here isaiah 14 and ezekiel chapter 28 describe the fall of real king each king's fall yes reveals something to us about satan's fall that is true but understand that they actually also talk about the fall of real king yes they tell us something prophetically about the fall of satan but this does not require a gap theory it does not require a gap there is no clear biblical basis for saying that Ezekiel 28 alludes to a garden that is different from the Garden of Eden. Satan could have fallen between creation and Adam's fall. Now the Bible didn't tell us exactly when the devil fell, at what point in time. The fall of Satan does not need a gap, does not need a billions and billions of years and does not need a pre-Adamic or a pre-historical gap for that to happen. And there is no clear evidence in the Bible for saying that the garden we read in Ezekiel 28 was different from the garden of Eden. We have to stick with the Bible and there are evidences. We must not allow the devil to undermine and to overturn the faith of many. Now we still, we, we are just saying that, look, this is what the scripture says, but you can say, but the earth must be older than hundred of years. 
let me give you an illustration let's assume that the day that god created the universe and i'm going to round up with this let's assume i think this is interesting let's assume that the day that god created the universe remember this is just an illustration let's say that god invited some scientists obviously he couldn't invite scientists because they were not created but let's assume just for the sake of illustration let's assume that there were some scientists with all their tools the day that god created in genesis chapter one god was creating everything remember let's say god have created everything you know first day second day third day you know god has created man the day the very first second millisecond that god created adam the scientists came how old will adam be by scientific tools the very the very millisecond that adam was created let's assume that adam was created a 30 year old man because adam was not created a day year old man or is a second year old man let's assume that adam was created 30 years old i mean by our standard today and the scientists came how old would, would the scientist tell you that adam was scientists will tell you we've measured the parameters we've done our investigation adam is 30 years old and science will be right if science knows his place all science can say about Adam at that point is that our instrument is saying that Adam is 30 years old and they will be right. But what science cannot say is that Adam was, was created 30 years ago. What science cannot say is that God could not have made Adam a 30 year old man. What science cannot say is that God cannot create Adam. You see, this is the problem. Science, it's okay for science to say, you know what, the other we can see in our front is a 30 year old and that is telling me something about the glory of my God. That is a God that can create. Science can say, you know what, Adam is 30 years old and that is fine. But Revelation tells us that that 30 year old man that you are seeing in front of you was just created a second ago. That man that you are seeing in front of you was not born, he was created a 30 year old. So we don't need a science to explain the Bible. We don't need to, to adapt the Bible to science. We only need to do this if we don't believe, if we don't know our God. The people that know their God will be strong and do exploit. They that come to God must believe that He is and is a rewarder of those that are diligently seeking. Science needed those years and billions of years because they don't believe in God. As Christians, we don't. Or what about when God created all the universe, the, the, the mountains and the hills? The very second that God created the mountains and the hill, scientists rushed there. Remember my illustration? Say, wow, this mountain will have taken millions and billions of years. You are telling me something about my God. Science can do that. Science can tell me that this mountain should have been billions and billions. It will have taken billions of years for this mountain to be this. Yeah, but God created it a second ago. Science can tell me that this mountain is billions of years old or millions of years old. But he cannot tell me that God cannot create it. He cannot tell me that God didn't create it. He cannot tell me that God did not create it a second ago. That is beyond science. Because that is my God. Your argument only becomes relevant if you remove the reality and the existence and the power of God. In fact, what science discovers should make you appreciate the glory and the power of your God rather than make you doubt the existence and truth about your God. Let's read Psalm 19 and then we will round up. I will read Psalm 19 verses 1 and 2. Psalm 19 verses 1 and 2. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsman. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. Listen to me. All those scientific findings, they are telling me something about the glory of God. They are displaying his craftsmanship. That's what this is all about. This is about God. Your God. And if you are not saved, it's the God that can be your God. Come to him tonight. God loves you. And that's why he, is doing, he has done everything to save you. Come to him and just confess your rebellion and your sin. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Ask him to save you. He will. And he will make you a daughter and a son. And he will take you home. You will become a citizen. Things may be tough on this earth, but it's not going to be like this forever. We are going home when the time comes, either by death or by rapture. Or when this world comes to an end, we are going home. We spend eternity with him. Don't miss the boat. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior tonight.